In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Christ is risen. You don't bother, don't bother. (laughs) You know, for this last two weeks, the week after Pascha, which is called Bright Week, um, and this past week, so for the last two weeks, and even today, the church in her liturgical cycle of readings has assigned the book of Acts uh, for our epistle lessons. And last Wednesday, there was, a, there was a particular epistle lesson that I found quite compelling. The apostles Peter and Paul had just healed a man who had been lame from birth. This was done, right, it's called the beautiful gate at the temple in Jerusalem. And, that, you know, this is kind of a, an icon of that beautiful gate, the Orea Pili, it's called. And predictably, the Jewish authorities were not happy with this, in this growing tide of uh, this Christian cult that was emerging and uh, threatening the status quo especially when Peter and John began to talk about the resurrected Lord and they were drawing a huge crowd. And so the temple officials arrested the apostles and put them in custody. The next day at the trial, the religious authorities asked them point blank, by what power or but why, but what name have you done this? And Peter, we are told, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, If we are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, let it be known to you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man who was once lame now stands whole before you. Now here comes the part that I found interesting. When the Jewish leaders saw the boldness of Peter and John, they marveled, Uh, not because of their words and not even because of the mighty deed of healing. They marveled, it says, because they regarded Peter and John as untrained, uneducated men. They were dumbfounded especially while the man who had been healed was standing right there next to them. And it just didn't make sense to them. How could these unlettered men do anything like this? So they commanded Peter and John to step outside of the council and they conferred among themselves. They're saying, what are we going to do with these men? A miracle has been done. It's evident. We cannot deny this. So finally, they determined that in order to stop the spread of this message among the people, they would severely threaten the apostles so that they could no longer speak to the people. Now, what happens next, you can read for yourselves in Acts chapter 4, but that's not my point, what happens next. My point is that no matter how eloquent the teaching, no matter how bold the demeanor, no matter how wondrous the miracle, And no matter how right the apostles were, it didn't matter. The high-minded Sanhedrin council, the supreme court of ancient Israel, refused to give these untrained, unlettered fishermen any credibility. Apparently, the stark contrast between their expertise of the law and the apostles' lack of training would simply not allow them, in their arrogance, to give a faithful response to the miracle or to regard these simple fishermen. Now, there's another example of this kind of thing, this disregard. Even if the person is right, a total disregard. There's another example of that today. Today, as most of you know, is third Sunday after Pascha, the myrrh-bearing women, Mirofori Yenekes or as my Goyans in Chicago used to call them, the uh, Spice Girls. But, uh, <laughs> but seriously, it was these devout and holy women 
our Lord gave the honor to be the first witnesses of the resurrection of Christ from the dead. They were the first ever to say, Christos Anesti. But here's the thing. In those days of the Jewish, Greco, Roman world, women were considered, were not considered as credible eyewitnesses. In fact, their testimony, I'm told, would not even be admissible in any court of law. And so when the mirror-bearing women ran out and told the world of the miraculous news of the resurrection, not even the Lord's disciples believed them, let alone the hard-hearted Jewish authorities and the rest of the unbelieving world. In fact, the disciples, we are told, considered the myrrh-bearing women's words as mere folly, an idle tale. So again, we are dealing with a situation where honest, faithful people are given no credibility. And I wonder, has anything like that ever happened to any of you in your relationships? A situation where even if you were right and the truth was as plain as day, still you were not taken seriously or given any credit or any importance, whether it was through prejudice, ignorance, some political power struggle, or perhaps simply because the person just didn't want to like you for whatever reason. You know what, my friends? Myth of Mazestead. Don't be in deep wonder about this thing or don't be anxious about it. It happens. It happens to the best of us. The real question is, how do we respond as Orthodox Christians to that catastasy, that situation? This, to me, is yet another indicator of where we are in our spirituality. Of course, for the natural man, the easy thing to do, the natural response is to be slighted, to be bitter, to carry a grudge right to your grave. But as pious and orthodox Christians, my friends, we are not called to be natural. We have a higher calling. God is not glorified in mediocrity. And so my provata, my friends, as your priests, I want to suggest to you, when misfortune and dishonor come your way, first of all, don't go to one extreme by underestimating yourself and falling into self-pity. Never underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit who can work through you at every priest's ordination. When the bishop lays his hands, just as it did from back to the first apostle, when the bishops lay their hands on the priests, make up whatever is lacking Holy Spirit. And it goes for all of you, your priesthood as well. Holy Spirit, who, which is what the very thing we are pursuing to acquire the Holy Spirit. Make up for whatever is lacking in us, Holy Spirit. So do not underestimate yourself or fall into self-pity, or underestimate what the Holy Spirit can do through you when you run into dishonor and disregard. On the other hand, the other extreme, I would ask that you avoid bitterness and avoid complaining. These responses only make things heavier for us and I would like for you to consider right being over being right. As uh, Sister Vasa says in those coffee cup commentaries, I love Sister Vasa. You should see her on, uh, I think it's, I don't know, on YouTube or something. I'm not sure where you find her. But, uh, you know, we all say, yes, we believe, yes, we believe. But do you believe that when you run into this kind of thing, you believe that the Lord is going to set things right. He is the ultimate judge. Do you believe that? If you say you believe, then don't act like you don't believe. Don't act like you're flying off the handle or you're falling into self-pity. That doesn't look like a believer to me. The Lord will vindicate you in time and relieve the burden of misfortune and dishonor. 
Let us believe what we say we believe. May God give us wisdom today.